6. Um, while you turn there, I want to start off this morning by sharing a story which, um, as you hear the story and then you hear a little bit later what I'm going to be speaking on, you might be wondering how the story and the sermon connect with one another. And in all honesty, they don't. But it's the application. It's good to be honest. It's the application from the story that um, has relevance for what I want to share. It's a story that some of you are familiar with, a story uh, that impacted our family quite dramatically six years ago when our middle daughter, who was in her second year of university, suffered uh, an unexpected and near fatal brain bleed um, through a series of miraculous uh, events and the hand of God intervening. Uh, she was not only rescued by emergency services, but um, throughout brain surgery and time in ICU, um, God miraculously healed her. Um, during that time, she had to spend 10 days in a rehab uh, hospital in downtown Chicago um, and three months thereafter as an outpatient. But during those 10 days in the rehab hospital, my routine, my rhythm for those 10 days was to make sure that I caught the bus at five in the morning to be at her bedside when she woke up every day. And one morning I got there and she was sleeping in a little bit. And so I went to go and find a quiet place where I could just spend some time with the Lord. And I went around the corner and found a, a sofa that was near a floor to ceiling window um, uh, in, in, in the hospital and uh, found myself sitting there just kind of reflecting on all that had happened leading up to the moment that I found myself in. It was February in Chicago. Uh, it was dark outside. It was overlooking the city. As I said, I was on the 26th floor of downtown Chicago. And the storm was fierce and angry. And I was afraid. I was really scared as to what was going on and very unsure as to how to navigate this, not only as a follower of Jesus, but as a father and as a husband. And I remember sitting there and began to form the words, what if? What if she doesn't recover? What if this hadn't had happened? What if it happens again? And as I began to form the words, what if? It was, this, it was as if the Lord put his hand quietly on my mouth and he said these words, don't ask what if. I've got the what if. Ask me what now. Ask me what you need to do now. And so I want you to remember that phrase, not what if, but what now, because we're going to come to it as we navigate our way through what I want to teach this morning. And what I want to teach about this morning is living generously. And as I say, the story has nothing to do with what I want to share. The full title of my message today is Living Generously According to God's Generous Pattern for Stewarding Our Finances. And let me be very clear that... Um, that living generously doesn't only have to do with our finances. Living generously is obviously something that overflows into all areas of our lives. But I think if we can kind of tackle the giants of our finances, if we can kind of crest the mountain of living generously in the context of our finances, it begins to overflow into every area of our lives. And so as we unpack what is God's generous pattern for stewarding our finances, we're going to be considering three choices, three dilemmas. There are three questions that we are going to wrestle with this morning. Firstly, will money be our servant or our master? Secondly, will we be motivated to give by guilt, by greed, or by grace? And the first two questions are going to set up the principle of God's generous pattern, kind of laying a foundation for us to get very practical on part three. And when I say what part three is, I hope I don't lose half the room. But I'm going to borrow a question from Hamlet. To tithe or not to tithe? That is the question. Now, in all respect, I could very easily uh, frame this morning by uh, this way. Firstly, what is Jesus taught about being generous? Secondly, we're going to look at a case study in uh, 2 Corinthians. What did the local church do with what Jesus taught? And then thirdly, what is our response to what Jesus taught? So firstly, will money be our servant or will money be our master? And we're going to have a look at the text in Matthew chapter 6 from verse 19. Matthew chapter 6 verse 19, Jesus says this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will, also, will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And you might be uh, kind of reading this passage and thinking to yourself, what on earth do eye infections have to do with money? Uh, what on earth is Jesus getting at? And very simply, just to give some understanding, a healthy eye or an unhealthy eye was a Jewish idiom, a, a local Jewish phrase to speak about whether somebody, somebody is being generous or stingy with their money. It's like a saying we have, and I, I don't know whether it translates here in, in Europe, but in America, if you have crocodile arms or T-Rex arms when it's time to pay the bill, you have T-Rex arms because you can't reach into your pockets to get the wallet. I mean, that's essentially what Jesus is saying. He carries on in verse 24. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, you see, some listening to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount might have been thinking to themselves, well, this has got nothing to do with me. I mean, there's no way that, uh, that money can, can be a false god in my life. And I want to challenge us, even as we kind of get started this morning, don't adopt that posture as we go through this, this message. A message on finances, you might be thinking, well, you know, that's great for somebody across the aisle, or that's great, some, that's great for somebody somewhere else in the room. But what is this message for me? How does Jesus want to speak to me about this message? And so what Jesus does, actually, is he personifies money. He gives it, in the original Greek, he gives it the, the name Mammon, which is the pagan god for wealth. So what is Jesus teaching in this passage that we've just read? Well, generally speaking, we're going to get to the specifics in a short moment. But generally, what Jesus is saying is, just as a campfire can be good, but a house fire can be fatal, money can be an excellent servant, but Mammon can be a terrible master. I'm just going to change this if you don't mind. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a challenge with this. It's just my glasses off. Thank you. Sorry, I tried to preach without glasses, but then I couldn't see anyone. So um, let's just go with this. Is that you, Craig? Is that you? <laughs> I don't see it. Thousands got saved today at the equip. <laughs> That's not the case. We're just kidding. <laughs> So in the same way that a campfire can be good, but a house fire can be fatal, what Jesus is teaching us is that money can be an excellent servant, but mammon can be a terrible, terrible master. Now we're going to get into three specifics that Jesus is teaching us from this passage. Firstly, that mammon calls us to be short-sighted, but Jesus wants to restore our long-term vision. Mammon wants us to focus on the things that are immediately around us, the things of this world. Mammon wants us to be consumed with the things that we have and the things that we don't have. In other words, Mammon wants, to, wants us to live at a place of constant comparison. Do I have what they have? Do I have enough? But let me ask you this, friends, when we live from a place of asking the question, do I have enough, when is enough enough? And if we ever were to achieve whatever enough is, then we are constantly living under the fear and anxiety of trying to sustain what we have already attained. It's a very dangerous place to live at, friends. When anything or anyone else gets into the center of our hearts and tries to lead us, it will ultimately destroy us. Jesus is the only one who can live and knows how to live in the center of our hearts and lead us without ever destroying us. So Mammon wants us to live at the place of constant comparison. And what we don't realize half the time, look at verse 19 and 20, is even if we have those things, they ultimately rust and decay and can be stolen. What Jesus wants to do, on the other hand, is he wants to heal our eyesight. 
he wants to give us a vision for eternity. He wants us to give us, he wants to give us a vision for, for heaven and how we are to steward the things that he's given us, the, the time that he's entrusted to us, the, the talents that he's given us, the treasures that he's given us. He wants us to steward those in a way where we are investing in eternal things. And he promises us that we would receive heavenly, heavenly rewards. I'd love to be able to stand here and give an, ex, an eloquent teaching on what heavenly rewards are. To be honest, I'm not 100% sure, but I will say this. Whatever they are, I want them. I want those heavenly rewards. The second thing that Jesus is teaching is that mammon wants us to be greedy but Jesus wants us to live generously. And if we live generously, if we have healthy eyes, verse 22, it impacts every area of our lives. The converse is also true. When we live holding on to things, when we live greedily, when we have an unhealthy eye, that impacts the rest of our body. I actually developed an eye infection about six or seven weeks ago. And I was drive, we were driving home from the office one day, and my wife very graciously looked at me, and she goes, uh, she goes, babe, has that eye infection infected your attitude as well? <laughs> and I say that because, <laughs> unfortunately, I had to say yes, because here's the truth. Every man in the room knows this, and every woman in the room knows this to be true about every man in the room, that when we develop a cold or a sore foot, it impacts and affects our whole body. And that's what Jesus is getting at. Every generous act infects the whole body in a positive way. Friends, listen to this. Every act of giving, every act of generosity, no matter how small is a violent attack on the hold that mammon has on our lives. The third thing that Jesus is teaching is that mammon wants us to worry, but Jesus wants us to trust him. In fact, mammon not only wants us to worry, mammon longs, mammon lusts after the reality of being the source of security in our lives. It's why we need to constantly remind ourselves and live on the reality of scriptures in the Bible, like Hebrews 13, where, where, we can, where Jesus says, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And we can respond with the, the declaration, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What worries us, masters us. What worries us, masters us, which is why just a few verses after the ones we've just read, Jesus says to us, do not worry. He says in verse 25, therefore, Matthew 6 verse 25, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? He, he, he commands, not suggests, commands that we are not to worry, which you might be sitting there saying, okay, that's great, but how do I not worry? Well, what, what do I practically do? Let me, I think this is true. Worry is the fruit of reaching into tomorrow and dragging into today things we cannot control. I'll say that again. Worry is reaching into tomorrow and dragging into today the things that we cannot control. We make tomorrow's issues today's worries. It's why Jesus says, do not worry about what you will eat. He's telling us that we will eat. Do not worry about what you will eat. Do not worry about what you will drink. Do not worry about you, what you will wear. You see, in the time of writing, food and drink and clothing were the main issues around which people worried. What are the main issues around which you and I worry today? Cost of living, our retirement plan, our education, our employment, God's breakthrough or, or God's provision. The, the question we have to ask ourselves is, is, do we trust that God has our tomorrow? Do we trust that he will be there tomorrow with the provision that we will need for that day? And if, if the answer is no, if we're not convinced that God will be there tomorrow, then we, we have a tendency to reach into tomorrow and drag those worries into today. 
Let me ask you this, a, a couple of simple questions, but how would you feel if you were absolutely certain that your heavenly father knew what you were going through? How would you feel if you were absolutely sure that God knew exactly how you felt and exactly how you, what you needed? How would you feel if, if you knew that God would provide exactly what you need, not what you want, but exactly what you need in the perfect time? I mean, that's 90% of the battle, right? I mean, when we go to bed at night and we lay our head on the pillow and the anxiety and the worry begins to start, imagine if in that moment we heard the voice of the Father saying, I've got this. I, I, I know what you're going through, and I know what you are needing, and I will provide that tomorrow. Friends, that's what Jesus is teaching. That's exactly what he is saying. That's why he says, I'm going to offer you an alternative from running after the things of the world. I'm going to offer you this alternative. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and, and, and the righteousness of God, which is found in Jesus. And, and all these things, the, the, the future, the worries of tomorrow, all of those things will be given to you as well. And so my encouragement to you is when there's a tendency to worry about tomorrow, look at what God is doing today and focus on that. Find something that God is doing today in and through your life or around your life and focus in on that because we need to be people that seek God's presence in the present. Friends, it's not what if, it's what now. It's not what if, and you can fill in the blank. The question we need to ask God is what now? So Mammon calls us to be short-sighted, but Jesus wants to restore our long-term vision. Mammon wants us to be greedy, but Jesus wants us to live generously. Mammon wants us to worry, but Jesus tells us to trust him. Will money be our servant or will money be our master? The second question I want to get to, and we're still kind of just laying a foundation for God's pattern for for generosity as we steward our finances, will we be motivated to give by, by guilt, by greed, or will we be motivated by grace? And for that, I'm going to look at two texts in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 8, if you want to turn there, the text will be behind me. And this is something of a case study of a, of a local church, the Macedonian church, who gave in response to most likely a, a kind of a, a, a teaching of something similar to what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to read from verse 1. And uh, uh, Paul writes, he says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. And so we urge Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. And then over to chapter 9, quickly from verse 6. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is also able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way 
so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This passage, the, the scriptures teach that we are not to give out of guilt because we must. That we are not to give out of a motivation of greed because I want something in return. But we are invited to give under the grace of our heavenly Father. And verse 1 and 2 of 2 Corinthians 8 make it very clear that because we give under grace, giving is not just for wealthy Christians. Because it is the grace of God that motivates us, the calling to give is for every single follower of Jesus. In fact, the Macedonian church were a church that was struggling under severe poverty. But the grace of God came upon them and motivated them to give abundantly because of that. I think it's so significant that the Bible was written at a time when the main economy of the day was, was farming, of sowing seeds and, and waiting and trusting in God to provide the sun and the rain for a harvest and then, and then harvesting. It, it was not written at a time of, of instant coffee and same-day Amazon deliveries. Because I think, unfortunately, that's the attitude we bring into the giving of, 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 you know, of the Lord. We, we think of instant results and instant consequences. So what I want to do real quickly is just uh, mention five or six analogies of a farmer sowing seed to what it looks like when we sow finances in response to the grace of God. And we need to go through this quite quickly because of time. Firstly, a farmer sows because they want to harvest. A farmer sows because they anticipate fruitfulness down the road. Friends, a, a farmer doesn't sow in order to sow seed to get more seed. A farmer sows seed to get a harvest. And, and we don't give money, we don't sow money in order to receive more money back. We sow money in order to see a kingdom harvest. And we're going to unpack that in a few moments. Secondly, and I would suggest this is probably the most important point of this kind of second section. When a farmer sows, there's death. That seed can no longer exist as a single seed. It must die in order to produce a, multi a multiple harvest. John chapter 12, verse 24 is a passage, is a verse the Lord has just been drumming on my heart recently. And, and Jesus says, I tell you the truth, unless a, a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. Jesus wasn't teaching on farming. Jesus was teaching about living. In fact, Jesus was teaching about dying. He was saying, as we, as we lay down our lives, as we surrender, to, 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 as we die to ourselves, that's where we find supernatural resurrection life. And that has implication to our giving. Friends, when we give, we don't give with strings attached. We don't give, and when we don't see the results we want, we quickly pull the string back and take back what we've given. When we give, we lay it down as an offering unto the Lord. And trust that in the right time, he will produce a supernatural harvest from it. The third thing is that when a farmer sows, they have to wait. You see, they have to wait because of the death and the, and the germination and the harvest that has to take place. A, a farmer doesn't sow in the morning and run back to the, to the field in the afternoon and is disappointed when there's no harvest. You see, a farmer sows in the morning and then waits for the right time for the harvest to come. And we mustn't be those that sow our tithe, let's say, on a Sunday morning and then rush home to our houses Sunday afternoon and get disappointed because there's not a pile of cash at our front door. God is not a cosmic ATM. God is not a cosmic ATM where we offer our prayers or we offer our tithe as if we're punching in a code waiting for cash to return. We sow seed and we wait for the harvest to come. And then fourthly, I want to say a farmer can't make crops grow. A farmer, whether they believe in the Lord or not, trusts in the Lord to provide sun and rain 
in order for the harvest to come. God is not looking for us to be successful, friends. God is looking for us to be faithful with that which he entrusts to us. Faithful sowers and then faithful reapers or harvesters of the fruit that is to come. Number five, and we're just moving on quite quickly, what the farmer sows and what the farmer harvests is different. I said this a little earlier, but the farmer doesn't sow seed in order to get more seed, but the farmer sows seed in order to reap wheat or in order to to reap bread. And we don't give money into the kingdom in order to receive more money in return. We sow money into the kingdom in order to receive a kingdom harvest, a kingdom harvest of souls, a kingdom harvest of the, the of churches being planted. I love the example of Barnabas in Acts chapter 4. We're told of this, this generous man called Barnabas, and he sells a field, and he lays the finances of that field at the feet of the elders of the church in Jerusalem. What did Barnabas reap in return? He didn't reap more fields. What Barnabas rep, reaped in return was a life on the road with Paul. What Barnabas sowed in return, as far as we know, was that he was single, but churches were planted. And the gospel was preached, and people came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's what Barnabas reaped. And then lastly, the more that is sowed, the more that is harvested. Not a one-to-one correlation, but a supernatural multiplication of that which God does because of our faithfulness. Will money be our servant or our master? Will we be motivated to give by guilt, greed, or grace? Hopefully that's laid something of a foundation for the last five minutes, because I want to get super practical. And as Hamlet once said, to tithe or not to tithe, that is the question. Super practical. And friends, this applies to every one of us. If you are faithful in tithing, I hope what I share in the next five minutes will give you some framework on how to disciple others as, as, as they become uh, uh, more mature followers of Jesus. And if you're not tithing, I hope this gives you an, an, an encouragement from the Lord, not from me, but from the Lord, to order our finances in the way that he would want us to. Very simple analogy, but I want us to imagine our lives as a, as a big tub with four taps flowing into that tub. And we obviously want our lives to live, uh, want to live our lives to the full. We want, our, we want that tub to be, the full, to, to be as full as it can be. And so for that to happen, we want those four taps to be flowing at full capacity. And those four taps represent four kingdom strategies, kingdom instructions on how we are to steward our finances. Tithing, giving generously, saving and investing, Spending wisely. Now, we don't have time to look at all four. We're just going to look at tithing. Tithing, giving generously, investing or, spend, or, or saving, and then spending wisely. Not spending, spending wisely. And we're going to focus in on, on tithing. And before we get there, I just want to say this, friends. Why do we tithe? We tithe in response to a revelation of a generous God. We tithe in response to a revelation of a generous God. Paul writes in Romans 5, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Simply to say, it is impossible to out-sin the generous grace of God. But then he goes on to say this in Ephesians 3, God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. He's saying it's impossible for us to out-ask or out-imagine God. The confidence that we have in prayer as we bring our petitions before God is not that we pray the right way, but that we are praying to a God who is exceedingly and abundantly generous and able to do more than all we ask or imagine. And abundance and generosity is in the very character and nature of God. The Father who loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son. Jesus, so generous that he was willing to go to the cross to die for every person who ever has, is, and one day will walk on this planet. And the Holy Spirit poured out not just a little bit to 
just the Lord giving just enough of the Holy Spirit to Fred for fear that he doesn't have enough for Malcolm. But the Lord abundantly pouring out the Holy Spirit on, on Fred, not depleting his resources to be able to do exactly the same for Malcolm. That's the God of generosity that we worship and serve. And we see this revelation in Genesis 14. In Genesis 14 is this incredible encounter that Abram has with this kind of shadowy, mysterious figure, the king of Salem, the king of peace. Up until that time, Abraham had only known God as Lord. But Melchizedek, king of Salem, reveals something of God that Abraham never saw. The Lord Most High, creator or possessor of heaven and earth. And in response to that revelation, Abraham says, I'm going to give a tenth as a representation of all that I have, because all that I have belongs to this God, the creator of heaven and earth. All that I have is thanks to you. So all that I have, I lay down at your feet. I'm giving back to you what is already yours. Martin Luther said this, that at conversion, there are three conversions that take place, the head, the heart, and the purse, or the wallet. I chatted to Malcolm yesterday, and he, he, him and I were talking about this. When, when most people get baptized in water, what are the three things they remove or set aside? They remove their watch, representative of time. They remove their wallets, representative of treasures. And they remove their car keys, representative of status. I would suggest, friends, that maybe today God wants us to baptize those things. He wants to baptize our time. He wants to baptize our status in Jesus. And he wants to baptize our wallets so that we can use our finances for kingdom advancement. Real quick, what is a tithe? It's the first 10% of our gross income set aside as holy unto God as an act of worship and obedience to His Word. And, and I, I wanted to say very clearly why the first 10%, why the first fruits, because that's what requires faith to give. If we hold on to, to until the end of the month and take the, the 10% that's left over after, we said, after we've administrated the 90%, is that much faith required to do that? Or do we bring those first fruits and lay them before the Lord? For the sake of time, I'm just going to skip over to the last thing I wanted to say. Okay. <laughs> Some of you might be sitting here thinking, well, tithing is an Old Testament thing. Tithing is something that was dealt with uh, under the law, but under the, under the cross of Jesus, we no longer need to. Do you remember that example that I referred to in Genesis 14 when Abraham had that revelation of God Most High and he brought a tithe? That was long before. I think it's 400 years before the law was codified. And Jesus, after the cross in Matthew, says this, what sorrow awaits you, teaching, talking to the teachers of the religious law. He says, you hypocrites, you are careful to give the tithe even the tiniest income, but you ignore the most important aspects of the law, justice, mercy, and faith. Jesus says, you should tithe. Jesus says, you should tithe. Jesus says, you should tithe, but do not neglect the more important aspects. I think the teaching is clear, friends. Jesus is saying we need to do it with the right heart, faith and mercy and justice, but we need to tithe because tithing is an, is an instruction from him and honors the Lord. My, my intention is not necessarily to arm wrestle with you. I want the word of God to impact your hearts. Friends, many things, yes, were, were done away with at the cross. Multiple sacrifices done away with at the cross because Jesus was the once and for all sacrifice. Special days, restrictions on food, limited access into the presence of God. But some things passed through the cross to a greater expression on the other side. 
The fact that it was not just one nation as the people of God, but the, now the people of God are people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. The Spirit of God not just poured out on a select few, but poured out on all God's people. The Word of God not just written on tablets, but now written on our hearts. And the same is true for generosity and the tithe. Not just kind of finding 10%, but an opportunity for us to be generous with everything that the Lord has entrusted us. Is there something in it for me? Well, you might think that's a very self-centered question to ask. But in the area of the tithe, we are invited to ask that question. Malachi says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. So there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord, I will open the windows of heaven. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Put me to the test. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. That's a clear promise from God of provision and protection. And I'm sure there are multiple testimonies in this room of people who have put God to the test. The challenge for us is, will we follow Jesus? Last question I want to ask, and now we, then we're going to land. Where do I give? Or specifically, where do I tithe? Let's be honest, friends. There are endless options for us to be generous. There are people in need. There are causes that we are passionate about. There are ministries and missionaries and interns who are asking us for their money so that they can do the, the work of the Lord. And of course, there's the local church. So where do I give? Well, I want us to step back real quick and find instruction from the word of the Lord. And before I read this passage from Galatians 6, this verse, I want to remind us all that every epistle is written either to a local church or someone who is in a local church. The context of the New Testament is local church. And Paul writes this in Galatians 6, take advantage of every opportunity to be a blessing to others, which includes giving financially, especially to one another in your family of faith, especially in the household of God. This verse plus 1 Timothy chapter 5 plus 1 Corinthians chapter 9 all speak about specifically giving financially within the local church. Plus Acts chapter 4, do you remember Barnabas bringing the proceeds from the sale of the field? Was laid at the feet of the elders of the local church. So I want to encourage you friends, where do we start? We start with our local church. The local church, if, if we are not able to trust the elders of our local church with our finances, we shouldn't be trusting the elders of a local church with our spiritual lives. We need to be sowing into our local church. And then from that, we give into other opportunities as the Lord leads. I wonder if we wouldn't mind just taking a moment to close our eyes. I'm going to be Three more minutes, Malcolm, is that right? Just as, is that all right? Just as we close in response. I trust today has been a, a helpful teaching, maybe a challenging teaching. But what good is it if we just come away with information? We need to just take a moment to respond to the Holy Spirit this morning. Maybe for some, maybe you can just close your eyes for a moment. In fact, you know what? Let's stand. Let's stand. It's good to be active as we respond to the Lord. And as you stand, maybe just posture your hearts, eyes closed if you feel comfortable to do that. For some, maybe this is familiar ground. But maybe an opportunity just to tweak here or a slight challenge there. Maybe the Lord just addressing an area in your heart. Maybe for others, this is an, inv uh, an invitation to to bring some of the areas in our lives, to have them baptized in Jesus. To, to, baptize, to be baptized in Jesus, that's, that's the language of Paul when we re receive Jesus, when we, we, when we receive the gospel. It says we are, we are baptized, we are submerged into, we are, we are placed and we are immersed in the person of Jesus. 
That phrase, in Christ, is a, is a phrase that Paul uses again and again. To be in Christ is not like taking a tool and placing it in a toolbox where it rattles around. To be in Christ means to be attached to, like a limb is attached to a body. It's that close. That's the reality of what's happened to us at salvation. I want to challenge us. Is that the reality in the context of our finances? Are our finances baptized in Jesus? Do you remember the picture of the, of the watch and the wallet and the car keys, our time, our treasures, our status? Are they surrendered to Jesus? Are they baptized in Jesus? I'm not looking for a response so that I can be encouraged. I think there's an opportunity to respond to the Lord. If you feel comfortable to do this, I want to invite you to take off your watch and to place it in the palm of your hand if you are trusting for your time to be surrendered to the authority of Jesus. Lord, I bring my, my schedule, my rhythm my life, how I'm spending my time, I lay it on an open hand. I'm not clenching it. I'm surrendering it to you. Maybe some have car keys in their pockets. If not car keys, maybe take out your cell phone, my status. Jesus, I don't want to be Lord. I want you to be Lord. Maybe some need to take out your wallets. Jesus, I surrender my finances. I want my finances to be baptized, to be placed in you, attached to you. I want you, Jesus, to be the Lord of my finances. Friends, the question to ask is not what if, not what if I don't have enough at the end of the month if I tithe 10%? Not what if tomorrow comes with a disaster? The question is what now? Lord, what do you want me to do now? What is my response now? What adjustments do you want me to make now? Jesus, would you show us? Holy Spirit, would you speak right now to people across this room as we surrender afresh our hearts, our heads, and our purses. Give us the courage to trust you. Give us the courage to trust you. Give us the courage to stand and to step through this open door of opportunity that you have swung wide before us. Thank you, Holy Spirit. What a wonderful sense of God's presence. If there is any condemnation in this room, we say no right now in Jesus' name. Conviction, yes. Condemnation, no. That's not of you, Father. Thank you that there is no condemnation for those in Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen. Amen.